Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast, My First Season. Very special guest today. My guest today started gymnastics when she was only three years old and developed a strong passion for sports and acrobatics. She then evolved as a gymnast for 14 years and in trampoline for three years. In 2017, at the young age of 17, she discovered a knack for freestyle aerial skiing and was invited to join the Canadian national team in 2020. Only four years later, in March of this year in Kazakhstan, she claimed a World Cup gold medal qualifying her for the Beijing Winter Olympics in 2022 in aerial skiing. If that wasn't impressive enough, she started her first term at Concordia University in Montreal in the Aerospace Engineering Program in the Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science, focusing on avionics and aerospace systems, while still on the freestyle skiing World Cup circuit and aerials. And she is a straight A student. There, I said it. She probably wouldn't want me to say that, but I said it anyway. So please, everyone, I want you to help me welcome from Sherbrooke, Quebec, Miss Marion Tenot. Marion, how are you? I am very good, and you? Thank you so much for coming on. Wow. This is, this Thank you is for a, having me. I'm excited. Oh, no, this is a great moment here because you are <laughs> you are Olympics bound. But before we get to that and your, your championship in March, you know, I want to talk about your first season in aerial skiing. And I mentioned you started gymnastics. So as I understand, your mother was a was a gymnast. Is that how you got into it? Yeah, my mother was a gymnast and a trampolinist. My dad was a pole vaulter. So sport was a very big uh, part of our family. And yeah, they put me in gymnastics when I was around three years old. I don't remember at all. <laughs> but uh, I just sport was a part of my life since as long as I can remember. And it started with gymnastics. Well, this is interesting because your mother was a gymnast. Now you're telling me your father was a pole vaulter. Both of these sports involve, or you have to have aerial awareness. I find it interesting yeah. that that aerial awareness was passed on to you. So how did they know you were going to have it? <laughs> or, or, or they just got, just got lucky? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I just know that from a very young age, I always like, you know, I'm a bit of a daredevil, like taking risks, like doing things that I not allowed to do uh, doing flips everywhere and stuff like that I think it's just a part of me that I I, I always had so I think putting me in gymnastics was a bit the, the logical choice for them and also it develops all kinds of aspects uh, of uh, sports and gymnastics that's a very complete sport and I really really loved it I like poured everything I had into it and when I started aerials they were both very surprised because it's not a sport you think about like necessarily when you're when you're a child at least in our family we're not a big skiing family we're more of an acrobatics family so yeah they were very surprised but I have a very big background in acrobatics and it helped me just uh, pour that into something new and it worked <laughs> unless I'm mistaken my listeners don't know aerial awareness means you you know where your body is at all times. So if you're doing, I don't know how many loops or, or what, what, uh, what do you call the term when you're uh, back flipping? Is it a back flip off? The... Um, flips and twists. Yeah. So, so you, flips is. The, yeah. So you, you always know like where the ground is, you know, <laughs> I guess that's something you have to be born with. Right. I mean, you, <laughs> because I've seen your videos and uh, it's pretty <laughs> impressive. <laughs> so that means you always know, you always know where your body is, right. No matter what flip or turn you're doing. Correct. I would say 95% of the oh, time. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, that, well, so well you, that, that's why we wear a helmet, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, you don't want, like, you need to know where you are. And most of the time I know, but I, I mean, every one of us gets lost sometimes. Like, it does not happen often. When it happens, it's not great. <laughs> but I mean, we always find a way back on our feet. But yeah, I feel like it's something that you're born with. But it's also something you can work on. Like we work it uh, a lot in trampoline and in the bungee. So it's like a trampoline, but and we have elastics that uh, are pushing us up so we can go higher and do bigger tricks. So we work a lot in that. It helps develop our uh, aerial awareness. And then after that, like to be able to know where you are at all times, it takes repetition. Like the first time you're doing a trick, you won't have all the information necessary to know exactly where you are. But as you do it and do it and do it all over again, then you could start to know what points you can look at the ground. One moment, am I in this position? Where is the ground relative to me? Where is the sky relative to me? And then you just kind of learn where you are as, as you go. But it takes a lot of repetition. The first trick you do, it's all your body. <laughs> like you, It's all your awareness that is, that is already in you. 
But yeah, it's very fun though. It gives a lot of adrenaline. <laughs> At 17 years old in your hometown of Sherbrooke, Quebec, you were kind of invited by a freestyle skiing coach to try aerials and you tried them on these uh, water ramps that we see uh, sometimes when we're driving. <laughs> so that's yeah. basically like you go down the long ramp. I mean, it looks like so much fun. So were you actually, were you scared or nervous the first time you tried? Um, yes, I was like when I did the RBC training ground, that's where I got recruited. Uh, I didn't think I was going to go in freestyle skiing. I had no idea at all. And it's at that event that the coach invited me to try it. And then I looked at videos on it on the internet. And then I was like, I'm never going to do this. This is crazy. Because <laughs> when you watch people do it on snow, uh, do it on, like so many flips and they're so high. I'm like, that is not possible. <laughs> but then I went and tried it on the water ramps. And yes, I was nervous, but it was just the, one of the most fun days of my life. I had so much fun. It was so new to me. You know, I had doing, been doing gymnastics for so long, but now I, I was in a totally new environment. And I was still like kind of uh, in my zone because it was acrobatics and I'm good at acrobatics. So it was so much fun. Yes, I was nervous, but for the first one, after I was just having so much fun and it wasn't long before I was like, okay, I think that's what I'm going to do after all. <laughs> And then I think roughly two years later, 2019, you started the North American tour. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I actually did it the year before, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Me, uh, no, I am mistaken. No, you're right. It was 2019. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. And, and, uh, and, and in yeah. your first year, you came in first overall, correct? Uh, and also, yeah, my first year on snow, I did the North American tour, tour and that was the year 2000. 18, 2019, and I came third overall. And in my second year on snow, I won the North American tour. And then the third year on snow is my first World Cup season that I just did last season. Wait a minute. So are you saying that during this tour, you you do on water and snow? You have a competition? No, no, no. It's only on, on snow. So okay. the, the season starts in November and ends around March. Okay. And so for the NORAM tour, as we call it, we have... Uh, five to six events in Canada and in the U.S. And uh, for the World Cup Tour, we have a bit more events and it's all across the world. But yeah, it's all on snow events and water ramping is where we train in the summer and when we do new tricks and when we build that repetition that is so important for us. You know, roughly, so whether you're doing, let's just say, okay, we'll use the water as an example, the water ramp. When you leave the ramp, how do you know the, approximately the height that you're getting before you fall down or start to fall? <laughs> I would say around, uh, I think I'm around eight meters high, maybe eight to 10 meters high. Okay. So, so you still feel the, the impact when you hit the water. I mean, that's still pretty oh, high, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, we do. And actually the impact when you land well on water, the impact is almost greater than on snow because when uh, we're on the water, we're landing on a flat surface, the water. And when we're on snow, we land on a hill. So we have a little bit less of impact when you land well. Yeah, you're, when you land on your back, it hurts more on snow. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> generally well, yeah. speaking. <laughs> yeah, if you've, if, you, if you've ever done what Mario does or, or snowboarded for the first time, yeah, you'll know. <laughs> you'll know how much it hurts when you land on your butt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's right. So when you're, when, quite when, often. You, when you're landing on snow, that's right. You're landing on an angle. So it's, it's a lot smoother. Yeah, whereas on the water, you're basically landing flat. <laughs> Yeah, when you land perfectly on snow, it is so satisfying because sometimes you just feel like it's almost easy. Like you're like just poof and you land. But honestly, perfect landings don't happen often for me, <laughs> I would say. And uh, most of the time, it's, I feel it. <laughs> but okay. sometimes when everything's perfect, it just, you don't even feel it. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about, you know, when you start getting up to like the World Cup, how many... Okay, first, how many judges are judging you? So there is five judges judging execution. Five? And what? Wait, so wait they, five? Five are judging the same thing, execution? Or yes. five? Okay, go on, sorry. Well, I mean, in execution, there is a many parts. There's the takeoff, there's the height and distance, there's the landing, there's your form. So execution is divided in many uh, like parts. But um, so these judges are going to give all... Uh, a note like a score on 10 and then the highest mark is going to be taken off and the lowest mark is going to be taken off and they're going to add 
the three other. So you have an execution score that is on 30 points. And then that score is going to be multiplied by your degree of difficulty. So the more flips, the more twists you do, the higher your degree of difficulty. And then that multiplied by your execution, execution score on 30 is giving you your total score. Are all the judges former aerial skiers? I don't think so. I think most of them are. I know that some of them are not. Maybe they were coaches. Maybe they had, I don't know, they were somehow related to the world of aerials and became a judge. I think uh, not all of them were former aerialists, but I think it also helps to have been one. So I don't know. I'm very familiar with the judge's uh, point of view, actually. <laughs> it sounds like the judging and aerial skiing is similar to floor gymnastics, right? Because of the execution and the landing. Is that, am I right? Is it similar? Yes, it, it is similar. Like it's a judge sport, of course. So yeah, execution, degree of difficulty, it is kind of similar uh, to gymnastics. Okay. So, side question, just a quick side question. If you're at a party, mm -hmm. do people just ask you to backflip? Like, do you, does this ever happen to you? Like... <laughs> I mean, yes, of course. Okay. okay wow. Uh, I right. don't do it. Oh, oh you don't? <laughs> Oh, yeah, you don't want to get injured, which brings my next no, question. Yeah. What's the worst uh, injury you've gotten during your your time in aerial skiing? So far, I have been really lucky. Let's knock on wood. <laughs> I think one of the maybe the scariest I've had, which turned out to be not a bad one, was just some some uh, I landed a job on my back, like flat on my back. And uh, I like I coughed blood at the bottom of the landing because the impact was so great. So then I had to do like a x-ray to make sure that my lungs were all right and that I didn't, I don't know what's the English word for it, but hurt my lungs. So that was a scary one because of course not rooting is not fun, <laughs> but it turned out that everything was fine. And I just had like four to five days just to let my muscles relax because everything was just so tight. So yeah, that was uh, maybe scary. And of course, what is always with me is my back. Because I, I mean, I've been doing gymnastics for a long time and now aerials, my back is not so happy with my life choices, but yeah, it's, it's just an ongoing thing. It was not just one event and I, it's just how I manage it on the day to day. At the beginning of 2021, you were in Moscow, correct? Moscow, Russia? Yes, I was. And there you placed third. Now, mm -hmm. what's interesting is, and that's, correct me if I'm wrong and I should know this answer. That's when you started your semester at Concordia. So I really want to know <laughs> how, how, how hard or difficult or was it not because you, you know, obviously it was a pandemic, so we're able to do everything online, but how, how did you find balancing the two, you know, being on the world cup circuit and studying engineering, not the easiest <laughs> program to go into, you kind of making uh -huh. it very hard on yourself. <laughs> how, how did you find the balance? I find it, I find it all right. Like, of course, it's not easy. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> and sometimes it, it's a lot of discipline and it's a lot of scheduling and, and it's a lot of thinking ahead because you don't want to be last minute when you're competing in a World Cup and you have like an assignment or something to do. So it's a lot of planning. But I remember because I was in, in CJP, of course, at the Four University in Quebec. And uh, I like knew everything about CJF now and I was uh, really uh, at ease like not being there and doing all my things in distance and I had like experience of dealing with of course uh, competing and studying so university was of course a little bit stressful for me because I was in a totally new environment without even being at school because I didn't know like my teachers I didn't know the environment and everything but honestly I got used to it pretty quick people were very uh, helpful with me like and during that semester, I remember I had a math class and the midterm was the, on the day of world championships. <laughs> so That's I was right. really lucky that I had uh, people that could help me to, you know, uh, for my exams and stuff like that. So I think the main thing is managing stress related to school, like the exams and the World Cups. And I want to minimize stress as much as possible. And one, once the stress is managed and I, I know everything, when everything is going to happen, I can focus on just training and studying. And I love like the studying part. I love learning, of course. That's why I'm doing it. So once the stress is managed, it's a lot of fun. But of course, it's, uh, it's not always easy. <laughs> when we talk about the World Cup tour now, what how many stops or like or countries, different countries do you go to on the World Cup 
tour? Do you know approximately how many stops are comprised mm -hmm. of a World Cup tour? Well, so I did one World Cup tour, so I can talk about this one that I did last season. Of course, it was a little bit different because of COVID. Uh, we were very lucky that uh, we had almost all our events because it's very easy to socially distance in Israel. <laughs> so we had seven stops, if I'm not mistaken. And we had, uh, we started in Finland, then we did Russia. We had two events in Russia. We have Yaroslav, which is a four hours north of Moscow. And then we had Moscow. And then we had Belarus in Minsk. And then we had Deer Valley in the US, which is a very big event because it's on the Olympic side of the 22 Olympics. Well, 2002, sorry. And then we went to Kazakhstan and we did world championships and one World Cup. So we had seven events and like uh, five destinations. Now, of all those destinations, was there one country that you hadn't been to before, but liked all but more than the others? I mean, uh, I have been going to Finland every year since the start of my career because that's where we do the preseason camp. So that was not new for me. I had never been to Russia, I had never been to Belarus, I had never been to Kazakhstan. Those are not countries that you think about, like, that you would go to one day. <laughs> I didn't think that I would go. But it was great, I mean, to just, yes, yeah, see things I never thought I would see eventually. But yeah, those were all new almost for me. Is Russia, like, a completely different country than Canada? I'm, I'm guessing it is, right? Yes. Uh, my first impression is really cold, but not, like, the temperature, but the atmosphere, you know, like, frigid everything's gray everything is cubic yeah it doesn't it doesn't seem uh, welcoming to me <laughs> <laughs> honestly well it's a good thing you're, then, you're you're used to the cold being from montreal so <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but i mean at the same time you arrive on the red square and, oh, right. and it's okay. beautiful so it's it's really a con and contrast but yeah very gray and frigid with how i would describe russia <laughs> you are able to visit some of the so you're not always training you do have time to sightsee a little bit so usually how it works we get on at the destination on monday and then we usually let's say have tuesday off and then we train on wednesday thursday friday compete on saturday so that's how usually it goes uh, so the tuesday is the sightseeing day of course with covid we did not do tourism at all except if we could walk there <laughs> So that's what we did in Russia. We we walked uh, a little bit in the city, of course. Uh, it was a bit stressful, like we were waking, wearing our masks and very being very distant from everyone. But we walked around the city and we were able to see a little bit what Moscow looked like. So that was fun. And then, yeah, it's the only day that we kind of kind of hang out and relax. And then it's uh, work time. And when you got to Kazakhstan, were you told not to do a Borat impression? Like, do they tell you? <laughs> Trust me, okay. some of my teammates did. <laughs> okay, that's right. Okay, got it. Do any of your teammates? Is there anyone on the on the World Cup circuit that that didn't come from a like a cold country? Is there anyone that I don't know came from Hawaii? Let's just say, or were they all really from? Mm. I mean, something that's very surprising is that Australia is very strong in aerial skiing for the women's side. Who who is um, which, which country? Australia. Oh, okay, that's right. But I mean, they do have mountains and snow. But yes, like, yes. And if you've ever gone to yeah. Whist Whistler or Blackcomb in BC, it's full of Australians, and I love yeah. Australians. So um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I spent a year there, so they already know how much. Oh, nice. Australians. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, otherwise we're all pretty much. Uh, there's a lot of, of course, Russians, uh, Belarus, a lot of Europeans, and us. So honestly, not very, uh, not much people from from hotter countries. <laughs> okay. So I like to, I've, I watched the video of your, your gold medal performance a lot in uh, Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. Now, is that guy on the side of the mountain screaming at you? Was that your coach? Okay. Yes, that was my coach. Okay. Well, he, looked, he looked very excited when, when you landed. So when you, when you, when you stuck that, you know, when you landed, mm -hmm. and you, did you know that you got first? Did you feel it? No, not no? at all. Because okay. I mean, of course I was very happy because I had done a good job, jump and I was happy with my performance, but how it works is that, so initially we are, let's say, fill the 25, then we do one jump, 12 girls go into finals, and then we do another jump, six girls go into super finals, and then we do another jump and then it's podium. So that day I was qualified sixth in the super final. So I, I was sixth, so I was going first 
So after that jump in the super final, there was five other girls to go. So of course I knew I had done a good jump and I, I was hoping for a podium with that performance, but there was five other girls to go. And like we used to say in our team in super finals, anything can happen. Anything can happen. Uh, there was five other girls to go. I was happy with what I did, but I was not sure that I won at all. It's really when the, the fifth girl went and I saw her jump, I saw her score, and then I realized. <laughs> How, how long does it take to get to you see the score after your jump, roughly? It's not that long. Like I said, a minute, maybe, maybe two. Okay, a uh, minute, and that's mm-hmm. uh, it's on a, like a digital scoreboard, I guess, when you see it. Yeah. So, like, there's a camera that is in your face, let's say, and you're at the bottom of the landing, and it's displayed on a very big screen that is by the air site. And when the scores pop up, the score pop under your face, <laughs> so you see it on the screen. Okay. And what's it like? And what was it like at that moment, knowing you were going to compete at your first uh, Olymp- Winter Olympics in Beijing? What's that? What's that feeling like? Uh, it was great because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, <laughs> I did the two podiums last season, which yeah, gave me my pass for Beijing. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was my goal. So I was. Uh, part of me was relieved. Part of me was overexcited. Part of me was so exhausted from the season. And part of me, like, it was so many emotions at the same time. At the same time, but. Yeah, I cried. <laughs> I was just so happy. It was just a mix of emotions. And it's so motivating to see that your hard work pays off and that you can, you know, be seen on the international um, scene. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was just a great moment. I think about it and I'm smiling. So yeah, it was great. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, the uh, Olympics are in February. So yes, how ahead of time are you going to, when do you expect yourself in Beijing to, you know, acclimatize and all that and get rid of the jet lag so how how many are you there a month before the olympics oh no honestly it's hard because we don't know yet because of the covid rules and everything what are we going to be allowed and not allowed to do so i don't really know (laughs) what we're going to do that's the what my coach is going to tell me (laughs) but yeah i i don't think i think we're gonna get there um maybe a week before our event i i that's a guess though I don't, I don't know. Uh, sometimes I know that in 2018, my team did a camp like uh, in Japan uh, because it was in South Korea. So, you know, to acclimatize and not have the jet lag and stuff like that. So we might do the same, but I have no idea what we're going to do. Do you have a um, secret or a tip for jet lag? How to get rid of it? Or you just have to suffer through it? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, well, I mean... I don't know if it's secret, but the secret is to go to bed as as late as you can on the first yes. day. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That is, I just, you know, it was funny. I, I remember in Kazakhstan, we arrived there. We were all so tired. It was like 5 p.m. And we're like, no, we're not going to bed until 9. And we were just together and we we're just putting loud music and trying to bump ourselves up because we were so tired because of course the travel to Kazakhstan was super long we were like no we're not going to bed until nine <laughs> and how, how and many of you it. how many of you made it <laughs> I think pretty much I mean I don't know about the others but I made it most okay. of us made it <laughs> uh, yeah there's nothing worse than arriving like in the morning after I don't know how many hours of flying and then mm-hmm. it's the morning they're, they're morning and then you have you know you have to go till nine o'clock at night yeah that's rough okay <laughs> but it works though like after that if yes. you can push through that first day honestly after it takes a day or two and you're and you're good to go a day or two wow you're tough okay <laughs> I, <laughs> s- I still remember it took me two weeks just to get rid of australia okay like when i when i arrived well, australia is also weeks. a big one <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right okay I'm really okay. I'm so excited. Uh, will you will you be willing to come on after you get back from Beijing? And tell us. Oh, sorry. How, will you be Will you be uh, able or willing to come back on the podcast after you return from Beijing and tell us what it was like? Oh, of course. Oh, awesome. Yeah, of course. Awesome. Awesome. You are sponsored. <laughs> you are sponsored by Royal Bank of Canada and Castle Skis. So that's pretty mm-hmm. awesome. Royal Bank in Canada is pretty huge, huge bank. If my listeners are American, but you know, I know they have branches in uh, in the states as well. Uh, they I'll... have a, an incredible program, and that's called RBC Olympian, which I'm part of. And yeah, it's really helping high level athletes across Canada, and it's a very great program. They help pay for uh, some of your training, I, I, I imagine, or uh, costs associated with. with yes, that. so okay. it's a financial support, and also they give me uh, opportunities, like speaking opportunities and stuff like that. It's really great. 
Oh, awesome. Awesome. Mm-hmm. I, I, now, I, in addition to your, your, your jet lag story, were there any other funny stories that have happened your time on the World Cup? I don't know, lost luggage or? <laughs> oh, I mean, travel days, like, it's almost a taboo. <laughs> Our team is just like, they are so complicated and like in especially in time of covid it was the worst honestly but i mean it i was i'm very grateful we could travel don't get me wrong but it was just very very complicated we had like files and files and files of paper and then covid tests and then it was it was very very hard but we all we made it everywhere and yeah i think Last season, of course, was all around COVID and not getting COVID. And I don't want to test positive because I'm going to be two weeks stuck in Belarus in a country I don't know that is very cold. Like, of course, that was all the time. But yeah, I don't know. I feel like there's so many fun stories that happen. I'm trying to think of one. That, That's okay. That we, can, we, can, we, we can come back to that question. Are you currently, like, I know you're, I know you're currently a, a student this semester as well, the fall semester. Are you, but are you currently training now? Like, am I calling you from a training ground? Actually, right now I'm home and I haven't been home in, um, in almost more than three months. Okay. So you're calling me in a rare situation for me. I'm in my room, <laughs> All right. but, yeah, but I was not able to uh, go on campus yet. It's going to happen next week for the first time. Oh boy. So okay. that- <laughs> that's exciting <laughs> well more or less everything's op- op- everything is open now more or less when, when i got there in august a lot a lot was closed you know <laughs> but now it's starting to feel yeah. like it was uh, it was before except for the masks okay. <laughs> yeah of course that we used to though <laughs> all right now dumb question where do you keep because i guess everyone has a or maybe you've been asked this question a lot where do you keep your world cup gold medal <laughs> is it at home uh, is it in a safe <laughs> No, there are uh, on my wall in my living room at home. <laughs> oh, really? I nice. Have, I keep, uh, yeah, my three World Cup medals are there. Uh, one, uh, like, <laughs> on the side of the other. I don't know if they're going to stay there. I mean, it's just when I came home from Kazakhstan, which was the last destination, of course, I showed them to my family, and it was nice, and I just put them in my living room and just look at them every morning, and I'm... It's kind of my motivation, too, because there's in the place that we can see them a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going I'm to be posting that the video of your gold medal jump in this episode mm-hmm. description so everyone can see it. And also your Instagram. So if you be, give her a big follow on Instagram, you post a lot of cool pictures from your, uh, from your, <laughs> from your training and, and also from the places you go to. Am I forgetting? Yeah, I think it's really the, Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. It, it's really the, the place that I put everything there that's relating to my training, my competing. And if you want to follow me, Instagram is the place to know where I'm at and what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Now, am I forgetting to ask you anything or is there something you, you wanted to say? I don't want to, I don't want to get, you know, let you leave without me, you know, if I'm forgetting something or is there something else you, you wanted to talk to us about? freestyle aerial skiing i mean i think everyone should go and watch it it's not a very uh, known sport especially like in canada it was very big before and now we're trying to bring uh, the hype back as we say so if you have the opportunity there is a world cup in quebec in january january 5th it's going to be uh, at le relais in quebec city and it is going to be awesome. So if you can be here, of course, it's worth the drive, I'm telling you. But yeah, just uh, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, of doing this. All right. Can you tolerate one more dumb question? Because I, mm-hmm. I've, I've been hesitating asking you this question. All right. So aerial skiing, I know. Now, besides the difference of the poles, because you do have aerial skiing with poles, am I, am I correct? Uh, like, attends, what? I've seen aerial skiing freestyle, but with poles. You know, people go downhill skiing, they have poles to help them. But I've seen people, now I'm trying to find the French word for poles. Uh, it's not poteau. Uh, uh, I, no, I, I know what yeah. the pole is, but I mean, in aerial skiing, we don't use them. Okay. But in mogul skiing, they do. Okay, Like mogul. when they have the bumps. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I'm thinking of moguls. Yeah, but you can, yeah, yeah. But you can also do backflips and moguls. If, yes, yes, okay. yes, exactly. That's so right. So that's a, yeah, like freestyle has a lot of disciplines. And uh, in, at the time, like, I don't know, I don't want to de- say uh, dumb things, but uh, like a few uh, dozens of years ago, we, you had to do like three disciplines in freestyle. You had to do aerials, moguls, and uh, ballet. But now uh, you can choose your discipline and only focus on that because I would be a very bad mogul skier. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> <laughs> when do you think your 
training for the Olympics will start will be at the end of the year? My training for the Olympics, I mean, started uh, four years ago, I guess, when I started. Okay, wow. Right. Um, but now, I mean, I didn't know it was it, but I, it was kind of part of it. And now, I mean, my all, my whole summer was focusing on cleaning my jumps for the Olympics, so having the best execution possible. I did a lot of jumps this summer. And now we are in a physical camp, so we go in the gym every day and just try to be as strong as possible to be able to uh, keep ourselves injury-free during the season. And I am leaving on November 11th for Finland, where we're going to have our first training camp on snow, and we're going to have a few World Cups there as well. I think the first one is December 5th, and the season is officially going to be on. It's going to be a very big season because, of course, Olympic year, people are throwing amazing skills and jumps. So we're going to, yeah, I'm very excited for that season. It's going to be great. Wow, that's awesome. Do you, do you like working out? Do you like doing the weights? Yeah, I do. Okay, it's cool. you know it's it's part of it of course we do it all the time uh, physical camps are always more intense of course but yeah i mean it helps me um be confident because when i'm at the top of the hill and i'm going to do a big jump i want to be sure my body can handle it of course and i don't i don't want to get injured as no one wants to so yeah the more i go to the gym the more i'm confident in my abilities that my body to sustain the, the impact so yeah i like it cool well, uh, Mario, I really want to thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story and uh, your first season in the uh, World Cup. Uh, it's has really been a treat to have you on. And uh, I hope you do come back after the Olympics to tell us I some more. I hope so, too. <laughs> so uh, I really, really want to thank you again. Uh, merci beaucoup. Hein? <laughs> Ça me fait plaisir. Thank you. Thank you to you for the opportunity. I'm very glad I joined today. Thank you. Everyone, that was Miss Marion Tenot from Sherbrooke, Quebec, Olympic bound. We will see you all next week. Bye.